public service, and I don't want to put any words in your mouth, so, I, I mean, the question I'd like you to answer is, what has been the biggest mistake so far in your view? But if you'd rather answer, what is the question that most urgently needs to be answered, that would also be fine. Well, I think, um, I'm happy to start with the first, which I think the, the biggest mistake, and I think those in the government would agree with it, was abandoning containment on the 12th of March and stopping testing in the community. Um, the countries that have pursued their testing and tracing throughout their outbreaks and tried to build up their capacity alongside have, um, yeah, have, have done much, much better. I think of Germany, South Korea, Taiwan, Norway, Denmark. So, yeah. And, and of course, with them, we move immediately, don't we, into almost a, a summation of the whole sorry mess because we were told they were following the science and as things have sort of frayed and fallen apart subsequently since that day in March, it would appear that decision was taken simply because we didn't have the kit. Does that tally with your understanding? Well, I guess I would challenge that because yeah. I mean, the UK is one of the richest countries in the world. And if we look at the countries that have built the capacity, these are not, you know, these are countries like Senegal, Vietnam, yes. Rwanda. So I think the thing, the, the, the big lesson that gets, if you look across countries, is it's about political will and a clear strategy from the start. To say this is what we're doing, steam right ahead with it. In mm. a sense, you have to move before you know if you're actually right in trying to, in, in, in a sense, like before you have exact evidence. But if you're consumed with the evidence and you're, you know, winding yourself in circles about it, then the outbreak moves on, the virus spreads, and you get yourself in a worse and worse position. Okay, so I. I why do you think it happened then? Do you just think, I mean, because from, from what you've just said, it was almost as if they, they were like headless chickens. Well, I think actually at the start, if I have to look back, it was treated by the scientific community who were advising the government like flu. Kind of this is a virus that'll pass through. And this virus is, 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 is it, the reason it's so dangerous. If it was clearly yeah. like MERS or SARS and it kills a lot of people, then you'd say, oh, we have to contain it, throw everything at it. But I think because we have the sense of, oh, 80% might be okay, it becomes quite dangerous to say, oh, we should just let it go through, which is what Sweden and the Netherlands are attempting. So I think it was this mixed messaging from the start and maybe mixed strategy of should we let it go through and keep the economy running kind of like what Sweden this would be the this is what gets filed generally under herd immunity um slight, slightly misleadingly but the, but the idea is that we build up immunity by catching it and recovering and and there will be casualties but that's the price you pay for herd immunity yeah i mean to try herd immunity without a vaccine and without a treatment means a lot of people will die and largely elderly people and those who are vulnerable and i think that's a moral choice that governments need to make that's not a scientific choice that's a moral choice yes. um i think it's personally very wrong but i guess in government it'd be great if there was at least honesty i think the swedish government has at least been straightforward with their public saying this is what we're going to try and this is what we're doing and, and at least you can have an open public discussion then about that <laughs> Yes, I mean, that, that is a contrast, isn't it? And uh, I think Sweden is now approaching the highest per capita death rate in the world, but the Swedish population feel that they at least knew what was happening and why. That, that, could that be in a more, more stark contrast to what's happening here in the UK? I mean, you must sit there as the chair of global public health at the University of Edinburgh, and I know, I, I hope this doesn't embarrass you, I, I know that in 2018 at the Hay Festival, um, I was there, but I wasn't at your talk, that you literally described... I mean, it's on tape. You literally described what what would happen in in the event of somebody in China contracting a virus from eating the the, the wrong food, and it then becoming a global pandemic. So there must be moments where you've wondered whether you've woken up in the middle of it, or, or, or you are currently in the middle of an anxiety dream. Yeah, no, definitely. And this, in a sense, I've been having nightmares since January as it's been unfolding. Watching it first in China, and then it's almost been like in, in slow motion seeing it roll out to the, to the world. I think what was predictable was that there would be a pandemic. I think what was unpredictable is that the two countries that would struggle would be the UK and the United States. Yeah.